Welcome to the Edition Financial Webinar, Where Did You Learn That? Debunking Credit Myths. Our speakers tonight, Katie Bowman, Susan Sherman, and John Lang Lois, are sharing their expertise from community engagement, real estate lending, and consumer lending, respectively. Feel free to type your questions in the chat box, and we will answer them throughout the presentation and during the Q&A session towards the end. And now I'll hand it over to Katie. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Nicole. That was such a professional intro. Uh, my name is Katie Bowman. I work in community engagement and partnerships here at Addition Financial. And uh, part of what I do is I am deployed out into the community to do financial education workshops like the one you guys are about to hear tonight. So thank you very much for tuning in. We really appreciate it. And we hope that this is um, as beneficial to everyone listening as it has been to the participants we've talked to in the community. Um, it is a group effort tonight. I have Susan Sherman from our real estate department with me. Good evening. And I also have John with us from our consumer lending. Um, Susan and John are both uh, relationship managers. So they work out in the community with our real estate loans, our auto loans and consumer loans. So they see it all when it comes to those credit myths. Hi, John. Hi, everybody. We're going to jump right in and we're going to talk about those credit myths that you hear from your friends or your coworkers or your family, those things that people say to you and they're they're just like, well, I heard if you do this, your credit score will go up. Or I heard if you do this, that's really going to hurt your score. We're hoping tonight we'll be able to debunk some of those myths and uh, shed some light on maybe where they came from, if they're partial truths, or if your friends are actually just getting you into a lot of trouble. So um, send your questions in. We'll try to answer them at the end. And we have a couple polling questions for you guys to see uh, how much you know about credit myths. So look out for those. On your screen, you see a pretty good score breakdown. So what this shows is when you're talking about your credit score, it ranges anywhere from 850 to 300. 850 being perfect, tip top shape, you're doing everything right. You have a long credit history. You're paying things on time. You got a lot of open trade lines, a lot of available credit. And then all the way down to 300, meaning you're in trouble. Uh, maybe you've had to declare bankruptcy, file bankruptcy. Um, so 300 would be an area where we know there's only, you can only go up from there. That's the good news. Uh, and then everything else in between. So um, I think what's important is Susan and John can weigh in on how these kind of um, change depending on the type of loan you're getting. Susan, I know when you're shopping for a new home, um, you don't have to break your back to get make sure you have an 850 to qualify for a home loan. That's correct. Um, you don't have to have an 850 um, or a 700. When you're looking at your screen, um, you can be as low as fair. Um, we can uh, provide a mortgage as low um, as credit score credit score of 620, um, depending on factors um, with that as well with the loan application. But no, the, there is a lot of myths out there that you have to be in the 700s or 800s to uh, qualify for a home mortgage, um, and that is false. Um, here, at addition, we can go as low as 620, um, but there are some other institutions out there um, that can go as low as 580 as well. Um, so, you are correct. You do not have to break your back to get to 850, um, but it's always good to talk to a loan officer when you're thinking of uh, purchasing a new home to, to see what you can qualify for with your credit score. Right. And I know uh, a lot of times people won't even apply for a mortgage because they just don't think their credit's in the right place for it, but they don't know that, well, why, why is that the case? Right because it's a long-term loan, right? Most mortgages are like 30-year mortgages. So the credit union or bank is counting on the fact that they have 30 years to collect that money from you. So they're not as concerned with the score. Whereas John, you in like car sales with car loans, auto loans, you see that there is a heavy emphasis placed on the credit score. There is. And, you know, at Addition Financial for anything not real estate uh, related, uh, we have different ranges that you would fall into. Our top tier would be a 765 and above. That would get you the best rate that we offer. Uh, down into a, you know tier two would be a 714 to a 764 
credit score range. So you can see there's a little bit of a difference between your averages up on the screen and what we would actually look at here. Uh, not to say that, you know, the, the credit score is going to, you know, completely mess you up as far as getting a car loan, uh, but it does dictate your payment and rate. Um, and of course, rate dictating your payment. So uh, you have to try to keep your credit within those boundaries to be able, and if you can get to the next level, that helps you tremendously. Right. So. They break it down into tiers for those consumer loans a little more, right? So down to, down to 630 would be our lowest credit score that we could take for consumer loans. Okay. So including the auto and unsecured lines. Great. Like well, that. I think that takes us into the first polling question. So this is where you guys get to tell us what you think and test your knowledge. So the first question is, what is your credit score if you have little to no credit history? A, 300, B, zero, C, no score, D, 600, or E, no clue, that's why I'm here. So tell us what you think. And I'm just going to wait to see what some of the responses are, see what some of the chatter is. Of course, that's why we're here. That's why I'm here. <laughs> yeah. So the, uh, okay, so question A, I mean, answer A would have been 300. So that is very low, right? If we think back to what we just discussed, 300 is not the same as ha would not be what you would get if you had little to no credit history. Uh, B, zero, if you put that, there's no such thing as a zero credit score. So that is completely wrong. Not even close, not even a little. So no such thing as a zero credit score, guys. C, no score. Ding, ding, ding. If you selected C, you guys got it right. There, That would mean that there is no score. So little to no credit history isn't necessarily a bad thing. It just means that you have no score because we don't have enough history to tell you what kind of lender you are, what kind of borrower you are, what kind of repayment history you have. No score isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just a place to start. And it doesn't also mean that you'll go from a no score once you've obtained any kind of credit to starting at 300 at the bottom. I uh, don't know the actual algorithms that they use to get that credit score up, but you, know, you can expect to be probably in the mid range once you actually finally get some credit under your belt. And obviously you're not having to start at that 300, which is the lowest you can go. Very good. All right. So on this slide, we're just kind of showing the group what con what creates that score and what the breakdown is. So when I'm uh, doing this presentation in the community at workshops, what I do is I compare this to um, a syllabus you would get for a class. So how is your grade created? You might have a certain amount of participation. A certain amount might be tests and quizzes, attendance. Uh, a group project, a term paper you're writing, your credit score is created the same sort of way. So these areas show you the breakdown and what makes up the biggest part of the pie. So obviously payment history, and you're going to hear this repeated a lot this evening, but payment history is really important. And when we're talking about payment history, we're talking about, are you paying on time? Are you paying at least the minimum? Have you ever been late? Are you continually late? Is it a habit or was it a just once in a while thing? So it's very, very important to pay attention to that payment history. Uh, we go down to amount owed. So how much are you carrying? If you look think about your credit cards, are you carrying a high balance? Length of credit history. How long have you had your credit? We're really looking for history. It's hard to give you a grade, which would be your credit score, without a history. So that weighs about 15%. And then the types of credit, it's important to make sure your credit is diverse, make sure that you have different types of trade lines open, meaning student loans, auto loans, mortgage, credit card, uh, maybe a personal loan or a home equity line of credit. Showing different types of loans is not the same as just having five credit cards and nothing else. And then new credit. 
So that is, have you applied recently for new lines of credit? How many times have you applied? Have you been denied? Um, are you opening a bunch of new credit at once? That's going to have a pretty heavy factor on that score. All right, Susan, we're jumping into the myths. All right, let's do it. Myth number one, the more debt you have, the lower your score. That would be a false statement. Um, it's more of how you utilize uh, your debt. The re recommendation um, with your uh, outstanding debt should be 30% or less. So let's say um, you have $100,000 outstanding. Let's say your mortgage, your mortgage um, loan that you have, the car loan that you have, any credit cards that you have all comes to 100,000. You should have your utilization at 30,000 or less, which means um, combining all the loans in the credit cards, your outstanding debt should not be more than 30%. So the lower your utilization is, the higher your score will be. Um, on the contrary, if you have more debt, if you're maximizing all your credit cards, then yes, that will definitely lower your score. Right. I think it's just mostly this myth pertains to what kind of debt you have, right? Yep. Not all debt is created equal. Uh, carrying $100,000 on credit card balances is way different than having a $100,000 mortgage. Absolutely. Installment um, debt is, is different than a revolving debt. Right. And that 30% on the previous slide is, is a pretty big factor. And when a creditor is making a decision on your, on whether or not to, uh, give you the loan that you're looking for. Right. So. Yeah. So remember that syllabus analogy guys and use that to your advantage. All right, John, take us into myth two. Myth number two, checking your credit will lower your score. The answer is also false. Um, it's highly recommended that you check your score often as you can. Um, and we're not talking about going to get new credit to be able to see a credit report, to be able to show you what your score looks like. Uh, there are options to be able to monitor your credit. Uh, sites like annualcreditreport.com is a very good one. Uh, you get one per year, and I believe it's free. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Don't quote me on that, but I've never done it. But, you know, I do know that it's there's one out there. Um, but that will allow you to be able to gauge kind of where you're looking at as far as score goes. I mean, you can look at the credit, but the credit doesn't always dictate a correction. The correction, the credit doesn't always tell you everything about the score. And a lot of lenders are going to look at a score first and then go over to the other aspects of trying to um, itemize your credit on how they're going to on whether or not there there's credit worthiness. Uh, there's also sites like Credit Karma. You've got your credit card statements these days will oftentimes say, hey, your FICO just updated. Um, you know, we're going to get into it later, but there are several different bureaus that they use to obtain that score. And though annual credit report will give you up to the minute score, the other sites that I just mentioned will typically, or your credit cards, will typically be that once a month where it gives you that score at that time. So you can't bank on that being your score. Let's say you're walking in to get a car loan. You can't bank on that being that score that day. Right. You have to kind of just use it as a gauge, but certainly make sure you monitor that to make sure you're not having a severe drop in your score. Because if it was, you may want to look into that a little further and make sure you understand why it dropped that way. Uh, there's a lot of fraud going on. So certainly that could be some kind of role in that. Um, and also, you know, you're going to see it rise as you pay your payments. More. Right. And, and one thing I'd like to add um, John pointed out that there's myannualcreditreport.com. So you can pull from each of the three credit bureaus once a year. So one um, recommendation I tell my clients is you can pull from one every four months. Um, so this way, if you're checking to make sure there's no fraud, uh, make sure there's nothing going on with your uh, credit score that you can pull from each one every four months because you're allowed to um, for each one once a year. Right. And it's annualcreditreport.com. I'm going to see if we can add it into the chat box for everyone. Annualcreditreport.com. And like Susan and John said, you get to pull one report from each of the three credit bureaus every 12 months. So you can spread those out and pull them every couple months so that you're keeping an up-to-date look on what's going on with that mm -hmm. report. And just keep in mind, guys, when we're saying checking your credit will lower your score, Checking your credit report 
doesn't uh, always lower the score. Checking the credit score doesn't always lower the score. It just depends on what kind of, um, what purpose people are pulling the score for. So if you're applying for a loan, chances are good. That's a hard inquiry. The score is going to take a hit in a Absolutely. couple points. If they're just pulling it uh, for employment verification purposes, you usually will not see that affect your score negatively. Typically referred to as a soft pull. Myth number three, closing a credit card after paying it off will help your score. That is also false. If you go back to uh, one of the previous slides, um, your history um, is a huge factor in your credit card. Uh, the longer the credit history, the less risk there is. Um, it's actually showing the lender that you are a responsible um, borrower that you've actually had history. It shows that you've been paying on time um, and how much debt you do have in the history. So it shows your uh, willingness for so many years of um, paying on time. So closing it out does affect your score um, and it can affect it negatively. Right. Um, well, also, you if you have, um, even if it's like a $1,000 credit card that you got when you were in college, right, your first credit card, maybe it's just 500 even, uh, you're ultimately shrinking down the available credit you have open to you. So if you're closing a credit card, that means you don't have that available to use. Uh, and I think that is what weighs the most when it comes to some of this stuff, the history, how much you have available to you. So you can say, oh man, so glad I finally paid that off. What a nightmare. I never want to see that credit card again, but cut it up, put it in the nightstand. Don't use it. Take it out of your wallet but leave it open because and that's going your, to affect your utilization. Right. Like we were saying, it's going to keep you going. Um, just make sure, you know, if there's any annual fees on it, because sometimes we forget that we are not using this card anymore. And then that annual fee sneaks up on us and we don't pay it. And then that is a late payment. So watch out for that. If you are putting old cards away and taking them out of your wallet. We're going to jump into another question. So everybody has the opportunity to show us what your knowledge looks like. So we're going into question two. And this question is going to lead us into the next slide. Approximately how long does negative information remain on credit reports? You can That's say a, a really good question. Seven years. B. Ten years. C, two years. Curious to see what everyone thinks. That is a great question. All right. So it looks like you guys know a little bit about this stuff. So if you said seven years, we'll give it to you. Uh, seven years is the average for the length of time that negative information remains on your credit report. However, if you are filing bankruptcy, we see those remain on there for about 10 years. So that was sort of a trick question. Um, two years was thrown in there because that's generally uh, what people are looking at when they're pulling your credit history is what the most recent. So past two years has a heavy emphasis on the score. So we just threw that in there to throw you off. And I just want to touch on that. It's from the time of that debt being closed not from the time of you um, having it open. It's seven to 10 years from when um, that debt was uh, closed off. Too bad it's not two years. Oh, that would be it great. It saved me right? some time in college. <laughs> seven years feels like a long, or a long time when you're waiting for that stuff to roll off. Well, you know, in 10 years too, also goes with judgments and liens too, as well as bankruptcy. So those big so things. So you got to yes. really be careful on any kind of public record information is typically the 10 year. Uh, most everything else can be that seven year mark. So, and there's a lot of people that get a little bit upset because they think as soon as they pay off a credit card that it shouldn't be on that report anymore. So that's going to take us into myth four. Paying off collections increases your score or removes the negative information from your credit report. Not true. So I know that it's such a relief and you feel like there's been a million pounds taken off of your shoulders when you pay off that monster credit card or you finally settle with the collections agency. Um, but unfortunately, that does not mean that 
all of a sudden you're going to see a big jump in your credit score. And it definitely doesn't mean that you won't see it on your credit report anymore. Uh, as Susan said, it's going to be on there for seven years from the day you paid it off or the day they reported the payoff, right? Correct. So, of last activity. Yeah. yeah. So depending on when the institution reports to the bureaus is going to be the date for the seven years, if you're really counting down to the day. Right. But you do want to pay off your collections because keeping it on there and not paying it off, it's going to do nothing but just bring your credit score down. Even if you pay everything else on time, you're doing your utilization, keeping a collections item open and not paying it um, will definitely keep your score down. So pay it off as quick as you can. Do it. Yep. Don't let it sit with a collection with the collections department or a collections agency. I always say swallow your pride, even if you're mad at the company. Yeah. Uh, fun fact, parking tickets and library fines do not show up on your credit <laughs> report, even if they're sent to a collection agency. So just saying, Still UCF. Pay guess for <laughs> memories of college. Yeah. <laughs> All right, John, you want to take hmm. us into myth sure. five? Myth number five, paying off your credit card each month is bad. That is a myth. And I will explain that there are some circumstances where that would not be a problem. Um, but typically, if you already have credit and established credit, you certainly want to try to get those credit card bills or correction, the utilization as we've been talking about, as low as you possibly can, if not paid off in full. Reason being, your interest calculation is going to go on to those credit cards. Um, you know, and specifically referring to a credit card, that's really um, a way to be able to continue to keep your scores up is to keep, the, again, utilization down. You want to make sure that you're trying to get that paid off for those multiple reasons. Uh, if you are new to credit, that could be a different circumstance. So, you know, when we say it's a myth, yes, in most cases, but new to credit, um, somebody who might have just one credit card, you know, maybe a, a student coming out of high school and wants to establish some credit, one of your children or what have you, uh, they may want to, you know, keep a small balance on there, obviously monitoring, making sure that you're keeping the balance low, paying off as much as you can. But those credit companies do like to see um, some payment history to be able to establish that score that we've been talking about this evening. So. Right. So the reason that we call this one a myth is because we don't want to see people carrying balances because if you're carrying a balance month to month, it means you're going to be paying interest on that. Unless you have a 0% introductory rate for your credit card, which is fine, great, good job, but we're trying to establish healthy habits. And the habit of leaving a balance on your credit card month to month is not a good habit to get into. Uh, we don't want to see people paying interest on those balances, and we don't want it to have that snowball effect in the reverse way where one month, one thing leads to another, and all of a sudden you're leaving 25, then you're leaving 50, then you're leaving 100, and then all of a sudden you're leaving thousands of dollars month to month, and you just got out of control. And it happens quickly, and it happens in those small increments that don't make us panic too much until one day we open that discover card app and we're like whoa and that introductory went away and the introductory yeah, yeah the zero percent <laughs> introductory rate went away and it jumped up to whatever the ridiculous rate is because you're new to credit so just keep an eye out for that and if you have an established credit history already and you've had uh credit established for a number of years this is not going to affect your score much either way so it's not going to hurt you it's not going to help you it kind of just does nothing This one's one of my favorite ones that we get asked a lot. Myth number six, when you get married, you have a joint credit score. Now, it is a happy time for most when you get married. Um, but I it, so. I hope so too, right? <laughs> um, but it does not necessarily mean that you have a joint credit score because it could go either way. If you had a joint, if you got married and go up or it could go down. Um, just because you get married uh, to your spouse does not mean 
uh, your score uh, will increase or decrease. You have to do a joint um, debt together. So if you purchased a house together, if you applied for a credit card together, um, if you applied for a car loan together, that can help your score. So if you have one spouse that has um, a lower score than the other and you do a joint together and you pay it on time, you could in the long term, help your spouse improve on their credit score. Um, but getting married right away does not mean you'll you know automatically have a joint credit score. Right. Your credit score is tied to your social security number. That's correct. So your score is your score. My score is my score. Just because we decide to put everything else together, together. does not mean that we're also going to split scores. I kind of like that. That's always a good one. Can't double the scores either. Oh, that would be a good oh. one if you could. I didn't think about <laughs> that. Wow. 400, 400 does not make an 800. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John, we're jumping into myth seven. All right. Uh, you only have one credit score, and I kind of alluded to this earlier. Uh, that is a myth. There are actually three different credit scores uh, currently in the United States that um, they come from three different credit uh, bureaus, and that's going to be Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. Uh, they are somewhat regional as of late. They've kind of gotten flipped around a little bit. Historically, TransUnion was more of a West Coast score, uh, used more um, more often over there. Your Experian was used more in the Northeast, and your Equifax more in the Southeast. Uh, again, as of late, they've kind of switched that around. So it's a, a good idea to keep track of all three of those scores. Uh, as Susan mentioned earlier, you know, doing one annual credit report on each one of those credit bureaus once every four months uh, would definitely help you to keep track of those scores during during those uh, credit pools. Uh, but definitely there are three credit bureaus, uh, certain banks, certain lending institutions. They can they can use one and not use another or vice versa. So you have to really be cautious. At Addition Financial, we use Experian. So, and that's going to be, and, and that's just with consumer lending because there is another score that Susan could probably allude to a little bit more on a real estate loan. Yeah. On the, and the real estate loan in the mortgage industry across the board, we pull from all three credit bureaus. Um, and every, typically every credit bureau will have a different score. Uh, for whatever reason, there are different reasons behind it. But the score that we use to tie it to your uh, pre-approval and your uh, rate is going to be the middle score. So once we pull from all three, uh, the one that drives your uh, pre-approval for your mortgage will be the middle score. Right. And I just want to um, clarify, there are three credit bureaus but there's all kinds of scoring models, right? So yeah, you hear yes, the word beacon, versions. you hear FICO, you hear Vantage score. So those are be the scoring models. And all of those could be different too, right? Because they're- yeah. Yes, that's they're, a great point. Yeah, they're all different and they're all calculating things differently for different purposes, for different loan types. Um, so I just also want to make sure we're clear. When you go to annualcreditreport.com, you get your- three free credit reports that doesn't come with a score necessarily. So that would be something you would have to pay for, but you do have access to your three free credit reports every 12 months. Correct. All right. We're going to go into question number three for you guys to participate. Tell us what you think. Here's the question. You only need to worry about what's on your credit report or your credit score if A, you're applying for jobs, B, you're applying for a mortgage, C, you're getting new insurance policies, D, you're applying for a new credit card, or E, all of the above. Susan and John are laughing at me. I guess that one was too easy. <laughs> no, he was very, being very nice. Let me see what the answer was. <laughs> How good. Because I, I said I'm learning too as we go along. Right. And it, <laughs> you guys are not having any trouble with these because that one, everyone got 100%. Everybody said E, all of the above. Um, that's right. So it's important to remember that even though you're not applying for a loan, you don't need a car anytime soon, you're not in the market for a new home, it is important to keep an eye on your credit report and your credit score 
because you never know when you could be looking for a new job, when you want to apply for new uh, auto insurance or homeowners insurance, your score is factored into those things. Or if you just want to keep an eye on what's going on with your credit report for identity fraud. theft prevention yeah. and fraud prevention. So um, keep an eye. Don't think just because you're not making big, big purchases and you don't need new credit that you shouldn't keep an eye on your score and your report. All right. Myth eight. So this is credit repair companies can help fix your score. Uh, this one is uh, a big one for me because these credit repair companies, um, some are legitimate, some are scams and you have to decide for yourself if that's something you want to take a risk on. But for the most part, these credit repair companies are going to take your money, maybe it's $99, and they say they're going to get rid of all the negative information on your credit report. What they do is they put in inquiries and ask about the credit information on the report with the bureaus. The bureaus have to remove that for an, a certain amount of time and investigate it. So the fraudsters will then take your $99 payment and they hit the road during that 30 day investigation. And uh, as soon as the credit bureaus determine that the information is actually true, guess what's back on your credit report? The negative information. But those credit companies, credit repair companies are long gone with your $99. So I just really wanna give a word of warning, be careful with these credit repair companies. There is nothing that they can do for you that you cannot do for yourself. There's no negative information that can be deleted. There's no negative information that can be removed unless it's fraudulent or unless it was reported as an error, meaning uh, maybe you have the same name as your dad and something from your dad's credit was on your report. So in that case, that could be removed. Uh, if there was fraud, if it was identity theft, that could be removed. But if it's just a case of you were young and dumb and got into some trouble in your 20s, uh, sorry, that's going to stick with you until it rolls off. So uh, these credit repair companies really cannot do much for you that you can't do for yourself. Okay, myth number nine. Another great question we always get asked. Getting a better job or making more money will increase your score. I truly would wish that if you did get an increase in, in your, uh, at your job, that it would instantly increase your score, but it doesn't. So the only way you can increase your score is if you take the extra income or if you get a better job that has, um, you're making more income and start using um, the extra to pay off your debt. The more you decrease your debt, the higher your score will go up. So yes, getting a better job and making more money will increase it if you utilize your extra income uh, the correct way, way by decreasing your debt. It's a real building process to come. If you've had bad credit in the past, like I talked about from college, uh, it's a real hurdle to have to jump, but it takes time and effort and patience, patience to be able to get that score back up to normal. And it will happen. A lot of folks might, yep. you know, get a little bit discouraged about it, but the reality is eventually that that turning point will happen and you'll start to see that your lower interest rate payments and your credit cards are going to be accepted. And, you know, that furniture that you want really want to put in that new house that you just bought, is going to be approved uh, at a better rate than what you were paying before. So, Ultimately, yes, it's a hard thing to do, but the best thing to do is to try to build your credit back up. So, yeah, and I mean, it does get it's a, a long process, but I don't know if you noticed this, but as I was rebuilding my own credit, John, I saw it was almost like the first few years were really slow. I was doing everything right, I was taking care of everything mm -hmm. I needed to take care of. But those first few years, getting the score up was like so, so slow. And then after for the first, I'd say like three years, I start, saw it jump up faster and faster. And that sounds about right. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's where that turning point happens. Mm -hmm. And you start to look back and say, wow, I'm glad I did that. 
But you got to stick it out for those first couple years. Yeah. You have to fight. It They're will long. turn around. It will turn around. Your score yeah. will you know, get not better. everybody has bad credit because they just didn't feel like paying. You know, life events happen. Yep. So ultimately, you have to try to kind of build yourself back up and it starts from square one and kind of work your way towards that, you know, three year mark where you start to see that, that needle start to point in the right direction for you. Yep. So um, high income does not help you get a loan. But I think where that myth probably came from was obviously if you're getting a higher paying job, you're going to be in a better situation to pay off your loans. So pay those debts off, yeah, pay them off, <laughs> pay them off. And uh, but it doesn't your income is actually not reported on those credit reports. Right. So that yeah. has no determining factor on your credit score at all. So don't think that uh, going from one job to another is going to do any kind of jump. But remember, the organization you're going to work for, or if you are starting a job hunt, be aware that uh, new or potential employers may ask you if they can pull your credit. So make sure your credit score is in a good place when you're starting the job hunt. Absolutely. Okay. Myth, myth number 10. Myth number 10 is one late payment won't hurt your score too much. Yikes. And that is, couldn't be further from the truth. Um, one late payment in my world, uh, I've been doing it for approximately 20 years, looking at credit files. Uh, one late payment could change your score by 60, 70 points. Uh, that's a tremendous decrease. And I'm not saying it'll change it by that much or by that little even, it could change it to a hundred points. Um, but it just, it's really a, a bad ding on your credit. Uh, where you say one late payment, you know, we're not talking about being two days late. Um, obviously every loan that you have, you want to try to get it in before that due date uh, or on that due date. You know, there is a late, uh, late payment date. Uh, in some cases, some cases it's late after the first day, but uh, you want to try to get that in, but the the one thing that I try to educate everybody on is please do not let it go past 30 days. Uh, that 30 day, as soon as it hits 30 days, that's what's going to affect your credit score. I uh, will be immediately reported to the credit bureaus, and at that point, that's where you'll see that major drop in your credit score. So be very cautious of that. You know, again, life events happen, so you want to try to make sure that if you're going to be late, and try to avoid it if you can. I reiterate. You want to make sure that you're not going to hit that 30 day mark, no matter what the cost. Just make sure you try to make that that payment before that 30 days. Right. Wouldn't you say communication is key? So if one of these life events comes up and you know your credit card is usually due on the 15th, but you're going to need an extra month because you got hurt and you've been out of work, call your lender, call whoever it is that you have that loan with or that credit card with and explain the situation and see if you can't get an extension. Um, you never know unless you ask. And a lot of times, unless it's something that you're doing on a regular basis, I think a lot of places are pretty nice about giving you those extensions once or twice. I mean, I don't think that it's something that you shouldn't try. It would be much better than just ignoring it and not paying it and letting it affect your credit negatively because it's not like it's just one tally mark after 30 days late, every 30 days thereafter, you keep getting negative reports, negative information on that report. And in the mortgage industry, in the real estate world, you do not want to be late on your mortgage payment. If you're late and down the road, you go to let's sell our house and buy another one um, within a certain time frame, you may not be able to obtain a new loan because of that one late payment. And it also affects if you're thinking about refinancing or maybe even getting a home equity line of credit. So you definitely do not want to be late um, on your mortgage payment because that could um, factor into you not be obtaining another loan. Reach out to your lenders. That's yes. the yeah. huge key. And don't ignore, you had said that word. That's a very big word that I've heard throughout the years. Um, you know, they don't go away. Right. It, the, the time, it's funny that we have a clock on this slide because time ticks. <laughs> and and then when you, when you talk about that 30 day mark, you really want to make sure that you're communicating with the lender, letting them know uh, the worst thing that you can do, and I had some previous collection experience, the worst thing you could do is just not reach out. Right. Yeah. Ignoring it won't make it go away. It's just going to make it worse. So yeah. definitely reach out and see what you can do to get some help. Communication is key. Uh, but also just to tag on to this myth a little bit, I have another sub myth. And that is 
uh, paying less than the minimum amount due doesn't count as a missed payment. That's wrong. If you are not paying at least your minimum by your due date, you're technically going to be um, marked as missed payment, uh, late payment. You may incur a fee, right? Yep. A late payment oh, fee. Yeah. So now you're that much further in the hole. And if you're letting it go past that 30 day mark, now you're taking a negative hit on the score. So it's just all of these things, they snowball out of control and it's one bad thing after another. Yep. Um, when you just ignore and throw that bill into the stack of mail that you don't want to open because you don't want to see the statement. We all have to adult someday. Put the blinders on. Yep. <laughs> the adulting. Call the lender. They can help in some cases. All right. Oh, it's your turn to do another question, everyone. So we have another question for you, another poll to participate in. So this question is, the first step to improving or repairing a credit score is, I guess actually it's not a question, it's more of a statement. So complete the statement. So A, hire a credit repair company or credit counselor. B, review your credit report or C open a new trade line or diversify to diversify your report. So completing the phrase, the first step to improving or repairing a credit score is, and the correct answer that we are looking for is B review your credit report. And you guys nailed it. Looks like everyone was saying B. So somebody's been listening. Somebody paying attention. Yeah. I like it. Yeah, guys. So the first Thank thing you, you want to do is make sure you know what's on your credit report because how can you go with either of the other two options if you don't know what's on that report? So the first step to repairing our credit is to know what's on our report, even if we don't want to look at it square in the eye. That's, I mean, everyone's got to start somewhere. So here's a couple other tips, a couple things to remember when you're trying to improve your credit score uh, or you're trying to rebuild. First of all, and you've heard us say it, and we will, I think, continue to say it, and it sounds so simple and so obvious, but pay your bills on time every time. Don't miss, not once, not even a little, not even a couple times not even by $5, pay in full, pay on time. Two, reduce your balances. So you could go with um, some of the uh, financial education methods that have been taught by uh, people like Dave Ramsey where they do the snowball, right? So pay the biggest debt first or the highest interest first. We've seen it done a couple of different ways. So attack one big thing at a time but still pay your minimum on time for the others and try to get those balances down. And three, only apply for credit or loans if you need it. Uh, they're going to be flooded to you in the mail, especially certain times of year, right around the holidays. I got a lot of um, holiday loan offers in the mail. And then this time of year, I get a lot of consolidation loans or balance transfers. A lot of those offers come through, right? Because we're getting through the holidays and people are paying for their Spent mistakes a little, a little bit. Spent a little too much. So, uh, but if you don't need it, you don't need to open a new credit card just for fun or because you like the design on it or because you think, yeah, I've always wanted a Discover card. Unless you really, really need a new car, new house, uh, a personal loan for something that you're trying to do um, in the home or uh, a mortgage, we're not going to just apply for things left and right. So those are the three big tips. Okay, we're back. Uh, we had some pretty good questions out there, and we appreciate these. I, I think that um, everybody's kind of asking the right questions to uh, be a little bit more of a pro here. Um, the first question, if you are trapped in a high interest car loan, would it be better to let the car go and simply buy a car outright? Uh, I would definitely not recommend this. There's a good likelihood that because you're in a high interest car loan that you either had no credit trying to build up or had some negative credit that affected your scores and therefore that put you into a higher interest. 
uh, keep in mind when you do something that in that fashion, it's going to end up causing you to be able to, or, or not causing you to be able to, but actually make you have to get those high interest calculations again. Uh, keep in mind, we talked about seven years on your credit, so that could really affect you for even longer than what you wanted to be. Um, the best recommendation is to talk to your lender, see if there's refinance options, see if other lenders have refinance options if they're not willing to do it, uh, to be able to try to get that payment lowered. Um, there's also ways to, you know, after a couple of years of paying your car, and we talked about the three-year mark where the needle starts to point the right direction, obviously that's going to help you to be able to kind of get out from underneath um, by going in, maybe trading in the car, maybe getting a different um, interest rate or something to that effect. Uh, but letting a car go is basically a repossession on your credit and your seven years basically starts over, you know, two, three months after that. So uh, the bank will take or lender will take a loss. So you got to be careful with that. Try to rebuild. I know it's hard, but keep your keep positive And eventually that needle will turn the right direction. Right. And uh, can you talk a little bit about for those that may not be familiar with refinancing, can you talk about what that sure. means? Yeah, refinancing is simply, you know, reaching out to your lender after a certain amount of time. And, and typically most lenders want 12 months of car payments. And I'm referring specifically to, to auto loans. But after 12 months of car payments, most lenders want 12 months. You'd go and say, hey, you know, can I get a refinance? What they'll do is review your credit at that time, which could essentially be higher and, and hopefully is and be able to look to see if they can get you a little bit better interest rate. You might be able to stretch out the term a little bit more to help you with that monthly payment. Uh, there's a lot of different options when you talk about a refinance. So very important that you kind of keep an eye on that. If you're starting to feel like you're struggling, you might be able to alter your payment by $40, $50 a month or more, depending on the type of loan you're looking for. Um, or you could e easily reduce the term and pay off earlier, just keep the same payment. But that allows you to be able to get that negative equity out of there. But that 40 or $50 a month, you could be applying to other high balance loans Correct. if you're saving it on the car loan. So it doesn't sound like a lot, but 40 or $50 paying off every month adds up. Slow and steady wins the race. Absolutely. Impatience. My favorite word tonight. Uh, another question we received um, is a good question. When is a good time to refinance your house and what factors make you a good candidate for this? Um, my answer would be why you would consider refinancing. Um, is it because you would like to lower the rate, uh, lower your payment, or maybe you're thinking about um, doing um, updates in the home or consolidating debt? Um, if you're just looking to uh, lower your rate or lower your payment, um, all th any of these reasons to refinance, the factors are you have to have, um, just like you did when you purchased your, your house, you have to have good credit score. Um, your income is still um, calculated in as well. Just because you're refinanced doesn't mean you have to, you're not going to send us all your documentation. When you purchase a home, you send your lend, you sent your lender a bunch of documentation. It's the same documentation that is needed for a refinance. So just because you own your home, um, and you just are looking to refinance, um, doesn't mean you don't, you're not going to show us your income. So all the factors are there. Um, a good time, um, why you want to refinance is if you had a high rate and the rates are low. Um, and typically, rule of thumb, it's not it's not concrete, is a 1%. So if you're at five or higher, now would be a good time to maybe consider looking to refinance because the rates are in the threes and fours. Um, so typically, a 1% um, or higher difference is a good time to consider or looking into it. Um, and when you're doing that, you may also want to look at your different terms. You may be in a 30-year right now. And reducing it to a 20 may be the same payment you're making on a 30, but it helps you decrease your um, loan um, amount quicker um, than paying interest throughout those 10-year difference. Um, and then consolidating debt, if you're looking to maybe pay off credit cards or maybe um, add to your house, um, all different factors go into that to see what your payment is. And you can save money overall by what you're paying on your credit cards and then rolling it into your loan. Um, but, but again, all the factors are good credit score and income to uh, cover the new payment. Right. And I mean, for both of those things, if you're refinancing your mortgage or mm -hmm. your auto loan or you are looking for 
a balance transfer where you're sending one balance from a credit card to another for a 0% time period, uh, or you're looking at a consolidation loan, in any of those cases, people are going to be pulling your credit report That's and your correct. credit score. So you're essentially applying for a whole new loan, right? Yes. So it's the same process. I mean, the same things are looked at and analyzed. Um, so just make sure you have good reasons for applying for or doing those things. Hope for that better credit score. Yes. Yeah. That should get you a better payment. If you know your credit score has gone up since you originally opened the loan, it's a good idea to Great give it a idea. try because if your credit score has gone up, that's not something that banks and credit unions automatically do for you. We're not monitoring your score throughout the life of the loan and decreasing your rate for you automatically. So it's your responsibility to keep an eye on that credit score and make sure you are refinancing or uh, getting a rate adjustment with some of these loans if you know your credit's going up or your balance uh, is different than it was when you first applied. So uh, I have one of the questions here. Will increasing my credit card limit hurt or help my credit score? So we sometimes get a credit line increase uh, promotion in the mail for our credit cards. And it will usually specify in that if you're getting that type of a promotion for a credit card, that in that case, typically you're not going to see any effect to your credit score either way. But ultimately, a credit line increase is a good thing because like we were saying before, you're just giving yourself more available credit. When would it be bad if you're maxing out your cards and you're getting the credit line increase because the credit card companies see that you're maxing out and you're almost at that available limit month after month? So uh, just know, again, you, you have to know your own reasons for why you're applying for a credit line increase or accepting one. But if you have a low balance or you have a credit card paid off and you get offered a credit line increase, yeah, go for it. If you want, yeah, you're opening up more available credit, which is ultimately a good thing. Don't do it to go out and get all those holiday gifts. No, <laughs> no. And they do, they send them then uh, yeah, all the time. Uh, I have another one here about, uh, someone's asking, um, they say, you say don't take out unnecessary loans or credit. I'm debt free and I pay my credit card on time. So why am I penalized by not getting a higher score? Um, I, there could be a lot of things going on. I would probably tell you to check your credit report at annualcreditreport.com through one of the three bureaus and take a look to see what negative information is hanging on there that's not allowing your score to go up. If you're truly debt free and you're paying your credit cards off on time, um, which I assume means you're using them and then paying off the entire balance, then you're right. Your score should be going up. But if you're just paying the minimum on time every month and you carry a high balance, you're not making late payments. I agree. That sounds like it should be a recipe for an increased score. But if it's a high balance and you're over that 30 to 50% of all available credit being used, that takes your score down month after month. So take a look at your report. There could be fraudulent activity going on on your credit report that you don't know about. And that's what is not allowing your score to go up. So can I just add to um, when, when you talk about, uh, we already talked about, you know, being stagnant for a little while and you might be before that three-year part. Uh, you know, and it, we say three years, give or take, we can't, there's no way to actually know that point where the needle starts to turn. Uh, but just definitely monitor your credit. I did also want to add to, and I probably should have mentioned this earlier, credit companies are required to take it off uh, a negative credit after seven years. Um, I've found in the past, and, and I've talked to many people who've had the same thing, that the credit's still there, the negative transaction might still be there. Uh, it may take you a little bit further to request a copy of your credit report. And then that credit report should be a dispute form that you can fill out. You send that in and within the next 30, 60 days, that report should be reflecting that that balance is no longer, or that negative transaction is no longer there. Keep in mind that seven year mark is really from the date of last activity. So you have to make sure you're monitoring that. Uh, but just because seven years went by, 
don't count on all lenders to just take it right off your credit. You've got to be vigilant and watching what you're doing. Right. Do we have time for one more question? So another question that came through said, are those ads that say the government will forgive your home debt if it's less than 160,000 true? I don't know of any government program out there that would forgive debt, not even even uh, uh, student loan debt. Um, there, there is no program out there. Um, I would say to be very cautious of this ad. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is some company is telling, trying to sell you that the government will forgive your debt, probably if you give them their your house. So if you sell a house or give them the house, the debt's forgiven because they're going to pay it off per se in some, some fashion is the only way I can really kind of wrap my head really quickly in regards to this ad. But um, I'm here to say there is no government program out there because if there was, we'd be saving a lot of people, a lot of money um, in, in our country. And so um, no, that ad would be completely false. Sounds like a scam. If it it's totally too is. good to be true. Yes. It, Probably is. Yes. Click me. Click me. Yeah. Yes. So be careful with those too good to be trues. Um, Nicole, I have a couple more questions. Do you want me to answer these or do you, are we going to go over the time? Is that all right? Okay. Okay. So uh, another question is um, someone has a 17 year old who's a senior in high school. Um, they have one of our addition financial UCF debit cards. Woohoo. Go Knights. Um, thank you. He uses it and he uses what he has in his bank account. So, um, that's a debit card. So that is linked to your checking account. Uh, if you're using a debit card, it may have the visa logo on it, which ours do. And it looks just like a credit card, but debit cards linked to your checking account are not going to do anything to your credit score. So, uh, with a debit card, linked to a checking or savings account, that's money you have in an account somewhere. It's your money. It's liquid. You have access to it. If you, a credit card is different because it's money that you're borrowing. So it's not your money. It's not in an account. So um, he's using a debit card. That's not going to affect his credit score, but we do have uh, credit cards, secured cards for um, kids, which means it's a credit card with training wheels, essentially. So secured credit cards are a great way to introduce healthy habits to young people or people recovering from um, some missteps. And those are, again, credit cards with training wheels. So I know, Susan, I think we'll talk a little bit about those before we wrap up. But um, yeah, he has a debit card that's not going to affect his credit at all. Thank you for being a member. Um, I have another question. Why would an employer need to know my credit score? Not all employers are going to pull credit, uh, but I would say a majority of people are pulling credit when you go into certain lines or industries. So uh, obviously to work at Addition Financial, our credit was pulled, our credit was checked. They cannot pull it without your permission though. So they're not going to be pulling your credit without you giving them um, express permission by signing a form. So you'll know that they're doing it. And uh they're pulling it because they want to make sure you're financially responsible. You have healthy banking habits. Um, it's uh, just a, another thing to set you apart from other people applying for that same job too. So if it comes down to really stellar applicants with great resumes, um, they have really great work experience. They both interviewed really well. Now here's another thing to help us determine who we're going to hire. So if one person has really great credit and the other doesn't, the employer may decide that that is uh, a sign of responsibility. So um, seems like a common trend these days. Yeah, it's just to set mm -hmm. you apart from other people. We just the more and more access we have to um, the same types of degrees and certifications, um, the more we have a need for things that set us apart from other people applying for the same jobs. Um, Another question, if I have a medical bill or other bill for less than $500 and I can't pay it at the moment and it ends up going to collections, how bad would it hurt my score? Should I bother paying it once it goes to a collection agency? 
Yes, please pay anything that goes to collection companies or collection agencies. You really want to make sure you start paying those off. However, I'll let Susan and John speak to medical bills specifically, because depending on what you're applying for, different lenders look at medical bills a little bit differently. But anytime anything goes to collections, it's a really good idea to pay it. I would also say if you have a medical bill, I would reach out uh, to that company. Majority of companies that have medical bills will accept a minimum payment every month. So whatever you can put towards, let's say you're asking $500, if you can put $25 a month to it, they'll they'll come up with the minimum, which they'll accept, let's say the 25, that will help not take that medical bill to collection. So as long as you're making a minimum payment of some sort on a medical bill, majority of them will not send it to collection because you're trying to make, you know, uh, pay it all off at some point. In you're time. showing good faith, right? Yes, you're showing absolutely. that you want to pay it off and you can't maybe do it all at one time, but yeah, you're at least showing that you want to make an attempt. And that's all they're doing is trying to recoup their costs. Yep. And in the real estate world, or if you're trying to obtain a mortgage, um, we don't force you to pay off your medical bills, but the medical bills are affecting your credit score. So not making the payments or paying them off um, will affect you over time with your credit score. Um, we can't force you. Uh, some credit some collection items, yes, um, it depends on these uh, the balance or what um, um, was sent to the collections office. So not every collection we're going to make you for us, but if there's a certain dollar amount, yes, we will have you um, pay that collection before you can close on that home loan. And keep in mind, a collection is a collection, mm -hmm. so it's on there for a purpose. It's gun. It's going to affect the score that mm -hmm. we've been talking so heavily about tonight. So just try to, as best you can, get those taken care of. Like Susan said, they they do a lot of workout plans, especially as it pertains to medical. Right. So yeah. definitely reach out and try to see if there's some kind of plan that you can get on and eventually get that taken off. And think of it this way. If you default on paying your auto loan, they can come take the car, right? So they can kind of try to make their money back. The person that let you borrow or the organization that let you borrow, if you stop paying your mortgage... They will foreclose your house. They'll come take your house. They can try to recoup costs that way. Nobody's going to come and undo your surgery if you had medical surgery. Correct. So no one's going to come get the shoes you bought at Macy's out of your closet if you have uh, lots of credit card debt. So <laughs> think of it that way, guys. They're just trying to recoup the costs that and the amount that they're owed for yeah. services that they gave to you. That actually rolls me into another question from our audience. But uh, do paying utility – sorry – do paying utilities, car insurance, store credit cards contribute to your credit score? Uh, I will tell you that the store credit cards are going to be something that you gave your Social Security for. They're going to affect your credit score. You must make sure that they're taken care of. Uh, a utility can become a collection. I've seen that. Uh, phone bills not, are not excluded in that. They actually uh, will show up on folks' credit all the time. Cable bills for sure. You Cable don't return bill that too. modem. Yep. You're in exactly. trouble. Exactly. So just make sure you, know, of course, and that's free money. So, you know, you don't want to just keep something because you just forgot to do it. Just make sure it's a priority to you so you don't see some $15 collection on your on your credit report. Uh, as far as car insurance goes, I cannot attest that I've seen that on someone's credit. Um, once you don't pay your insurance, though, they cancel you. So and be aware there is forced place coverage in some companies. I know Addition Financial is one of them. You have to make sure you cover your car uh, with full coverage throughout the life of the loan to avoid that extra cost for forced place coverage. Great. Okay. So I think we're going to wrap it up. Uh, Susan's going to talk to you a little bit about some products that could help you um, build or reestablish some credit. Um, these are products we do have at Addition Financial, but you can see, you'll see secured credit cards at just about every bank or credit union. So these are things that you can find anywhere. And we're just speaking to what we know about them from a credit union standpoint here at Addition Financial. Yeah, these are two great products that can help boost your uh, credit score if you're looking for ways to boost it. Or even if you have, um, let's say, a child that um, is starting college and has zero credit uh, no score. No credit. No credit. What's Sorry, no credit. Zero doesn't exist. No credit. Um, these are two ways to help uh, build up your credit um, uh, score. 
The uh, secure credit card will be as a revolving debt on your um, credit report. And then the um, opportunity credit building loan um, will reflect as an installment loan. Both are um, uh, counted differently um, when you're looking at your um, credit score and how to boost it up. Um, an installment loan will help increase your credit score a little faster than a revolving, but there are ways um, to help build up your credit score over time. And like Katie said, we do offer these here at Addition Financial, but reach out to your own financial institution as well, and they can um, uh, they will probably offer these as well, um, which will help you. Great. Um, and we're just going to wrap it up. And like all things at Addition Financial, we like to leave it on a high note and end it on a positive note. Your value as a person is not measured by a credit score. If you have low credit, it just means you're a higher risk to a lender when it comes to repaying debts. But it doesn't have anything to do with who you are, if you're a bad person or a good person, if you're responsible or irresponsible. A credit score is a way for a company to determine what kind of risk you are. And they don't know you. They don't get to know you. They don't take you out on dates. So they only have this score to go off of. And that is your financial reputation. So um, just think of it that way. But it doesn't determine if you're a good or bad person. Um, it just determines that uh, number. So don't let it uh, follow you. Don't let it define you. Don't let it determine what your habits become because you're trying to file in as someone who has bad credit. So you might as well be irresponsible with other things. Start working on it. You can improve it. A lot of people have come back from bad credit bankruptcy. So it's not the end of the world, but it is going to take some hard work. And we've also seen a lot of people that have really, really great credit that are not super nice. So Good credit does not make you a good person either, but uh, that is a fair statement. Let's hope we've let's hope we've helped those folks out there, you know, be a little more educated Absolutely. to be able to have those good credit scores. Yeah, empower yourself. And I would say, um, if you're thinking about purchasing a home and you may have to um, improve your credit score or your credit report a little bit, I always believe in don't don't um, get uh, sad or, or feel frustrated that you'll never own a home. I always believe in if now. If not now, when? So you just have to plan along, make your payments on time, improve your credit score, and you will be able to uh, purchase a house if that's in your future. Well said. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. So thanks everyone for tuning in. I hope you could take away Thank some you. tips and tricks tonight. I hope that there were some things that were helpful. Even if there's one thing you took away from this or learned, uh, we consider that a success and we hope it will continue to empower you on your financial journey and propel you forward into the future so that you can make healthy financial habits uh, part of the daily routine. Thank you, Katie, Susan, and John. This concludes our presentation tonight. Check your inboxes for an email containing a link to tonight's recording. And thank you all again for joining us. Good night.